All right, we're back, ready to progress with our 135 Apocalypse tank. We still got stuff to do before we actually do the physical mating of the upper and lower hull. Finally, do the wiring to get these LEDs mounted in the headlights um, because that's got to happen. So basically, the turret is then going to be not connected. Well, I guess we'll say connected but not attached, um, but it's going to be then physically connected to, to the upper hull. Um, and then there's still some more weathering to do um, with pigments and stuff and uh, dirtying up these tracks. So before I move on with finishing steps on this apocalypse tank, I want to add something that's missing and that a lot of uh, Soviet Russian tank model manufacturers have not included until fairly recently. So when the Soviet Union made tanks, T-55, T-54, T-62, all the way up to T-80s, um, they didn't just throw fuel drums on their tanks. There was always a, a hosing and, and um, plumbing system to get fuel from those fuel drums into the actual uh, engine. Um, you know, and then they could drop those fuel drums when they entered combat or they were empty. Uh, for a long time, model companies just gave us those, those drums on the back and they just sat there. Um, with that detail of the actual uh, plumbing to get the fuel from there into the actual tank gone. Uh, it's only fairly recently that some companies have stepped up and started giving us those pieces. Now, for example, this is from the, the Meng 135 uh, T-72B3, and there's actually some rubbery pieces that you would connect to the rear deck fuel drums to do that. So. In order to add just a little spark of realism to this, what I want to do is I want to scratch build because there's there's no parts for it. Um, and even if I were to like use something like this, you know, there's only they would fit actually, but there's only there's only one of these in a kit, and I'm not gonna not gonna buy more kits just for that. So I'm gonna scratch build some hosing from these fuel drums into the upper hole piece. And I'm going to have to do that before I move on to assembling the rest because I need to, to get that done. So in order to make this happen, I'm going to be working with some tin lead solder wire. I'm using this. This was suggested to me by somebody in a Facebook group that I'm, I'm part of. And this is a great idea. This is very flexible, um, but it also will sit in whatever position we leave it on. So we can make our hoses, um, but we can also have them sit in the appropriate positions we want on the tank and um, we can paint it and everything just like normal. I've got some styrene tubing that we can build the rest of the plumbing out of because what would what would really happen is there'd be a hose coming out of each fuel drum and they'd uh, connect into a uh, central kind of hose. So we'll have hose, hose, and then there's actually, if you can see over here, there's some paneling that would be a great way, a great place to connect those two hoses into an input into the tank. So that's what we're going to work on. So we'll use these, um, got just a multiple from Amazon, multiple diameters of tubing that we can, this is a millimeter and a half, by the way, thickness. So I'm sure we can find um, a tube that these fit into nicely. And there is one right there, I think that we can use as kind of a connector piece and, and just build up what we need to. So I've never, I haven't done this before. This is going to be first kind of experience for me. So let's figure this out and get to it. We'll be bouncing back and forth between a 1.5 and a two millimeter drill bit. That's all we'll need for this whole thing. It may look like I actually have a plan here. I'm making this entire thing up as I go along, just trying to figure out what might look a little realistic as I build this. The goal is to model the solder wire so it looks like an actual heavy gauge fuel hose sitting, sagging with some weight on it, not just some wire we stuck in there.
this right here is a very crude connector piece that's going to let us connect the two fuel drum hoses to the hose leading into the engine. Just a little jump ahead, our two finished fuse hose assemblies. They look fairly decent, I guess, for last minute decisions and assemblies, but they're ready to go and uh, we'll paint them up and detail them with the rest of the tank. So now that we have the fuel hosing all figured out and I've got the top separated again, I've got to do a little bit more sanding here and then maybe just restore a little bit of this finish once we're sanded, I'm not sure. But I have just a little bit more weathering on the tracks I want to do. I still might use pigments and everything, but I want to see how the dirt, the dust and dirt deposits work out. I saw them on, um, I think, Jick's channel doing um, some Team Yankee painting. And I figured that it had a good, good look to it. Now, again, that's a very small scale vehicle compared to this. So I don't know if this will give the full look that we're looking for, but brown earth deposits, I think, would be pretty pretty similar to the European earth. Um, so the three set I ordered comes with sand yellow, which would be kind of deserty. Light dust is, is a good all around dirt color from what it looks like, but the brown earth looks pretty similar to European earth. So I'm gonna get going with using some of this. And it just, uh, it's very liquidy, but when it dries, it has almost like a pigment kind of look to it just to settle all around tracks and wheels and everything. If we still have to use a little bit of mud, or, or maybe a little bit of, of pigment you know, placement on there, we will. But I don't want this to look super muddy. I don't want it to look like it's been sloshed around in mud. I just want it to look like it's been driven around and, and has a little bit of life on it before we start. You're gonna hear me later on say that this did not come out and give the look that I was hoping for. But I think it's pretty important for me to say right now that I don't think I use this product properly. After watching some more videos after I was done, I just think I applied it incorrectly. I think I ap applied it like I would a wash rather than really, really using it to fill in and let it really settle. And so the fault is on me, not, not, the, not the dust and dirt deposits, but we'll try it again some other time. The end result is not quite what I was hoping for, so I guess we're gonna go with the pigments anyway. I guess it is, like they said, it's a dirt and dust deposit. It's not, it's not the same as pigments, but you know, it's always good to try out a new technique, try out a new product. And I think this will work really well uh, for layering, you know, dirt and dust sort of around panels and around um, corners and stuff when we're weathering. So I'm gonna get to doing the good old pigments and uh, you know it does it does provide kind of that layer of dirt like that just settled layer of dirt around uh, all the road wheels and all that and everything and then we can just layer on kind of heavier bunches of, of settled and disturbed earth and dust you know with the pigments is the look I was really going for. Dirty, used, not covered in mud that's gonna throw a track or anything, but definitely out in the field for the day, maneuvers, combat, whatever. But you can still see the details underneath it. I've said it over and over and I'll say it again, this is the best flat I've ever used and ever will probably. I love it, I swear by it water soluble, easy to airbrush, easy to brush on, highly recommend it for everything. All right, time to pay attention to the upper surfaces. So I filled and sanded the hammer and sickle here because I didn't like the big raised thing. It, it just wouldn't go well with what I'm doing. 
but I left a little relief. So I want to add some cast texture to the front of the hull. Again, slight realism, it's seen on Soviet tanks. So we're going to do that with some Tamiya Extra Thin and a Stiff Brush. If you haven't tried this technique, it's really easy to do. I find that the key is just to not go overboard. Work in small sections at a time and just take it easy. It's, it's always possible to add more, but you know, once you've, once you've done it, you don't want to have to sand it all and start again if you've done too much. One of the last steps so we can get the hull put together is to get these headlight mounts clipped and assembled so we can pass the LEDs through and get everything mounted up. I didn't know it at this point, but I'm making a critical error and never having worked with LEDs before, I should have passed the LED up through the hull to avoid having to do a lot of removal of the LED from the, the bracket here. Um, having never worked with LEDs, I didn't realize how fragile they were. Spoiler alert! I'm going to break the leads on the LED with the constant bending and removing, and that's going to be a whole other problem. And that's going to delay finishing this model by quite a bit. It's been a while since I got to work on this. Uh, you know, me not being electrically or mechanically inclined. I, you know, I had to I had to get replacement LEDs, which I got off of Amazon, and I got a bunch of them because they don't sell them in small batches. Uh, the LED itself was a little bit wide, so I had to do a little shaving. I had to get it reconnected and solder, and but I fixed the broken LED, and it does work, and it actually does now fit inside the housing. There's um, I'm concerned because as you can see after this had a uh, it's had a resistor on it and then after doing the connection and getting it all secured on um, and I'm not a very good solderer so it ended up becoming a little fatter um, you can see it's not as nice and thin and trim as the other original connection is but it does it works so we've got full use of all of our lights again and now I've just got to proceed to manage to get the LED itself mounted into this little holder bracket we've got and get it nicely sorted into where it's going to sit. And that might be a whole nother fun interaction things. I'm going to do that off camera. I'm going to get both of these mounted. As soon as we get these mounted, we can get the upper hole mounted onto the lower hole and we can get moving with actually getting this thing built. All right. With the headlights now mounted in the upper hole, we can finally get these mated together. And this will just press nicely right there. And we will have access to that to change the batteries through taking off the turret if need be. And one more test, make sure all the wires still work now that everything's mounted. And cool, this is the first time we're really seeing what this is all gonna look like mounted up. The next step is going to be to get the pieces for the plow together. Now the plow is removable, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna assemble the plow together and I'm not sure if I'm gonna want that plow on there full-time or not. I kind of like the look of this tank without it. Then it's gonna be masking the lower assembly that we've already done so we keep all that nice work and putting the, the 4BO primer on here because I decided that in doing this, you know, wanting to do more of a modern kind of realistic sort of look to it of a Soviet tank, I'm gonna use the three color Russian forest scheme. And we're gonna talk more about that as I paint.
did a lot of the work to get these these blades to fit in off camera um, because it was just gonna be very awkward and with the angling to do it on camera. These do not like to fit in perfectly the way they they go. And the assembly looks great, but you know, they say that you can you can choose to um, you know mount them or dismount them or like it's just not worth the effort to have them to, to put them in and take them out and put them in and take them out. So I really recommend that once you get them in, if you want them on, once you get them on, you leave them on. Um, it's just not a fun process to do. As I was getting ready to uh, start our primering of this vehicle, I realized there's something missing, something painfully missing to really make this a Soviet tank. And you know what? It doesn't have the log. It needs a log. It can't be a Soviet tank without a log. Every Soviet tank has an unditching log. So I went looking and I actually have a, a Meng T-72B3 that's gonna be used for another project. And in that specific project, it's not gonna need its log. And, and we'll see why at a much later date. It also is not gonna need its tow cable. And you know, for a tank in service, we could, we could use a tow cable too. So I took the tow cable from the Meng and I took the unditching log from the Meng. And, and what's fortunate is, it's it's one of the kits that has a really nice not only a detailed log but it has the brackets it has the, the mounting hardware so we can uh, use that to affix it on there um, so i can either cut some some slots to put those tabs in or i can just cut those tabs and just glue it flush so that wasn't a whole lot of work um, got the log secured where it needs to go i moved that shovel to where the other Pioneer tools are, right here on that bin. And we've got our tow cable. I just used some solder wire to make some brackets that would hold it nicely along the hull, keep it out of the travel area of the turret. And it goes along and we've got it secured. We have a fully primed tank. And you know what, it looks pretty good just like this. It really does, but we are going to move on from there. Um, so. I was worried a little bit that thickening up the, the layers of paint on here would affect the ability to turn on and off the lights, but we're not, it doesn't do that. I forgot to mask off the LEDs, but it turns out that with the paint we're using, all acrylics, I could just use a, uh, a precision Q-tip here, dipped in a little bit of alcohol and clean it up as we go, so it was not a problem. We still have a little bit of the hammer and sickle there, which I decided, you know, as I was filling it in, I was gonna leave it just a little little indented there. I kind of like the way it looks. What we're going to do, as I had uh, mentioned, or maybe did not, I don't know. We're gonna paint this in the Soviet 80s uh, slash 90s era three color forest camo. And that's a bluish gray, a muddy brown, and an olive green. I'm gonna put a healthy dose of chipping medium over all this primer first so that we can get some um, nice kind of worn chipped effects because this camouflage would have been applied over the standard Russian green. This was a uh, an in the field applied paint job at kind of um, the Soviet group of forces in Germany. This would have been applied um, in a forward area and it would have worn as, as the tank went out in the field and everything. So this is the set that we're gonna use. It has some great colors for some modern Russian schemes. It also lets us do some earlier um, schemes from all the way from uh, Commonwealth of Independent States back into some, some former Soviet schemes. And like I said earlier, the one that I really wanna do is the late Soviet forest scheme. It is a weird looking camouflage scheme. It doesn't seem to make any sense. Now this was used by the Soviet group of forces in Germany. This was the front line against NATO. There were Soviet units deployed in East Germany. They were all guards army units. So the forest scheme 
although it looks a little bit wonky in terms of colors, was designed, remember this is in late 80s, uh, when NATO tanks, the German Leopard 2s, the British Challengers, and the uh, American Abrams, were getting their, their good IR sights online, their thermals and uh, infrared sighting systems. And it was supposed to make a harder contrast with those those that generation of IR sites and everything. From a historical perspective, we know that this is um, almost a modular kind of, for lack of a better word, camouflage scheme, much like the uh, American Murdoch scheme was, where you had base colors and you could swap out the secondary colors for, for different for different environments or different schemes. We also know that there was a little bit of leeway on the part of the ground commander to use um, slightly different shades or, or whatever they had on hand. So you will actually see this, this forest scheme used, um, but from time to time, depending on the pictures, uh, you'll see the colors just slightly different. I actually think that I made the right choice going with the alternate paint scheme. I like it. I like it a lot. Um, this is a, I might have already mentioned this in in, in voiceover, I'm not sure, um, but this is a, a paint scheme that was seen a lot on T64s, uh, T72s, and some T80s, and I think it looks actually a lot better than the, uh, the one with the brown. Giving this all a little time to dry, we can now start our fun chipping process and I haven't decided just how chipped I want to make all this stuff but a little chipped fairly chipped I want it to look pretty used and I'm wondering how chipped the the black green is, is going to end up looking um, because it is such a darker color looking pretty good and that's kind of the effect I want is a fairly used vehicle here 
showing the primer underneath as this uh, field applied camouflage wears so I'm gonna keep working this and uh, I'll show you the finished result when I'm done well I really I really like the way the colors look on this I'm not sure about the chipping with the the black green because now it's just so close to the primer it's really hard to tell but the other colors worked out really really well um, I'm starting to second guess myself now thinking maybe I should have just stuck with the original the original forest scheme with the brown but I think, I think this came out pretty decent pretty good all things considered and I, I really like the colors It's just, it is hard to tell the difference between the dark green primer and the black green. At the last minute, I decided I did not, in fact, make the right choice with the alternate camouflage colors. So I went back and I redid all of the black green in the original brown it should have been, and now I'm sure. Now I'm sure that we've got the right color scheme going on. I think this, it just, you know what, it's the original and it's the way I should have gone in the first place. and. I'm pretty happy. I think this looks really good. So for the brown, I ended up mixing a couple of different colors from the uh, Soviet set. I mixed the whole brown and the orange brown. Uh, the specific ratio, I couldn't even tell you. And then I added a little bit of ivory. I just kept mixing it. Uh, it, was, it was much more of the whole brown. And then I just lightened it up as I went until, until I was happy with the colors. So. Like I said, complete custom mix of what it is. I can never do it again if I tried. Fortunately, I don't have to. So what I'm gonna do now is to do a little bit of dry brushing of some bare metallic colors, because we definitely, you know, especially on these blades. So they're gonna, they're gonna get a healthy dose of bare metal showing through uh, and the plows. And I'm also going to, even though I've got the primer showing through pretty well on the chipping all around here, I'm going to do some bare metal showing through on just some some edges uh, around some hatches definitely around the the clamps where the tow cable is going to hook in um, and just you know around like i said around some edges uh, i think dry brushing is is pretty old school at this point right so i'll just do that off camera i think everybody knows how dry brushing goes and a little edge highlights with some bare metal and i'll come back and i'll show you what it looks like um, and I will also do some detail painting. So I've got to do with the log. I've got some uh, wood crate to do, um, handles, uh, tools, you know, lots of little details on this before we can put a clear coat on so that we can start with some washes and everything. I spent a ridiculous amount of time trying to get a realistic weathered wood look on, on this uh, box here and on the log and stuff. And I bought this Vallejo set just for it. They've got some really nice instructions in there. Uh, mainly it has to do with airbrushing though. So I just used some of the colors and, and really just messed around. And I'm happy. I think it came out pretty good, but um, I don't know. I spent way much more time than I should have just trying to weather up this crate. But you know what? I wanted a nice detail there, so, so I think it looks okay. I did some dry brushing with some uh, ammo gunmetal to reveal, especially on the plow surfaces here, you know, bare metal all throughout, and then uh, little bits of uh, rust, of uh, Panzer Aces dark rust, and then uh, some actual uh, Vallejo track wash, which is a rusty color. And again, especially up in the exposed. Um, bare metal areas, um, but then just in some of the, the the metallic exposed areas around the tank as well, uh, just to give it a very well-worn in the field look. Um, now I know that this is this is this is much more weathered than you see on most normal tanks of a professional army, having served in uh, an armor unit myself, but. This is, you know, again, caricature is the word that I'm, I'm using here. 
and I've used it with other models um, before. Because this is such an extreme kind of uh, character of a tank, um, I'm giving it a, a real extreme look. I kind of lost one of the spare tracks. I think I actually threw it out on the screw before I cut it off, but I decided to make up for that with, with some stowage. We don't normally see that on Soviet tanks, but um, I decided, you know what, there's only, there's only one flat area where they would put it if they could. So this is actually from a, a, a Verlinden um, US Abrams stowage set, but the pieces just sort of fit really nicely. So I painted them up in various colors and then used a little um, Citadel Agrex Earthshade just to, to shade them a little bit. And what I will do when I'm all finished is I'll make some tie down straps to actually secure them here. Uh, they won't just be sitting there, obviously. The reason I left these missile tubes um, fairly unblemished is because I'm going with their, their uh, you know, anti-tank guided weapon, uh, guided missile kind of, kind of idea and a lot of the Soviet weapons come in these disposable um, uh, polymer kind of plastic kind of tubes and that's what I'm thinking they are. So they wouldn't show you know a lot of um, chipped paint or anything like that but you can see that on the metal racks that support them I've got some chipped paint um, and it's kind of hard to see but on the metal you know uh, assembly that holds them on I did that and that's just me trying to trying to tell a story you know of the tank itself the smoke launchers painted. I'm really happy with the way it's it's coming out and looking so far, um, especially with the you know I put a little damage on the on the plow blades here. Um, originally, I wasn't even sure if I was going to use these because I just thought they looked so over the top, but I think they really look good, you know, with the, the finished kind of camouflage scheme and everything. I'm mean, gonna also added a little bit of stowage back here too. I can't remember where that came from. Oh, and then the very, very, you know, this is kind of out of place for a modern uh, armored vehicle exhaust, but when we do see exhaust like this, what usually happens is the high heat basically cooks off the paint, it exposes bare metal, and it gets very, very rusty. You know, this is a very World War II, Korean War era kind of way to do uh, tank exhaust, but the way I did this is, again, painting with uh, the Panzer Aces Dark Rust, and then um, Vallejo Track Wash on top. And it gives you a very realistic looking and almost textured, um, heavy rusted look. And you do it so that there's just a little bit on the, the protective grill over there, a little bit of the actual paint showing through because it's not all rusted off yet, but it, it's gonna look really good, especially when we, we put our washes and, and some soot and weathering and stuff on there. So the next step is going to be to get a, a gloss clear coat on here so that we can start with some washes um, and uh, decals, then some washes. Then it'll be just about ready to finalize, to, to get it all matte and dull, and then work on, um, you know, lenses and optics and stuff like that as a last step. We'll be all set. This is a nice, glossy tank now. I have a small stockpile of future left over in a large medicine bottle that I used. Um, I use it sparingly because I don't know, because I'm probably never going to find any more. But it was, I thought, just the right choice for this. So, um, unfortunately, you know, in the gloss, a lot of the, just because now it's all shiny, a lot of the metal effect is lost, but we'll get that back when we do the, the final flat coat later. But you know, it's, it's hard to see because everything is shiny now, the actual um, bare metal, but we'll, we'll get that back. When it comes to markings, Soviet tanks didn't have much. They've got some numbers, uh, bort numbers, bort meaning side, just like on uh, fighters. And this being group of Soviet forces in Germany, the support vehicles had a crest that they had, but the tanks didn't. They, just um, had the guards insignia because a lot of the group in Soviet forces Germany were guards regiments. I don't have any um, modern, you know, Soviet era T-80 decals, but what I do have are some Verlinden dry transfers. And if you're not familiar with how these work, a little different from decals. They, um, I'll show, I'll, I'll, I'll do them on camera so you see, but basically you press this against the model and you rub it 
and it sticks. You don't have to put it in water, it's interesting. Um, I have the decal set that I used when we did the Zvezda egg plane, and it actually has some guard insignias there, which are the perfect size to use on this model. So I'll be using the guards insignia and figuring out where it's gonna go, because normally they would be either on a searchlight uh, cover or, or kind of right on the front of the turret, but you know this doesn't have the standard turret shape. So um, we're either gonna have to put it on the turret side where the numbers are gonna go, and typically there would just be one. But the way that we're going to do it, if we're going to put it on the turret side, we'll probably have to put one on each side. I'm not sure how it would look to wrap around that area over there. first wash that I'm doing here is MIG black panel liner just to fill in the recesses in the engine air intake grill and a couple other little recessed areas around the engine deck. Even though this is intended to be used for filtering and filter effects, it's going to work really well to lay the base layer for our kind of dirtied up combat vehicle. Okay, now I won't be using this dark wash uh, across the entire vehicle. I'll be using it kind of strategically um, on some of the more prominent areas where I really want to catch the eye, especially on the brown areas where, where the three-tone filter won't really show up that well. But also, uh, you know, I don't want to lay it everywhere because we're going to be layering some more effects over it anyway, so I don't want to just put wash where we're not even going to see it. Just thought it'd be interesting to take a look at all the q-tips used to remove all the excess wash from this whole vehicle just going to use the rust streaks really sparingly along the tow cable and along the tow cable brackets um, just to show a little bit tow cables get really rusty in real life on armored vehicles because the paint chips off it and exposes the bare metal as it bends so this will add just a real a little bit more realism in real life to it Now that I realize how to actually use this stuff, I feel like we're going to get some nice dirty deposits along the vehicle to show some time in the field, and uh, you'll see I think it's, it's going to have a really nice effect, especially once we add pigments to it later on when it's all done. Just like when I was working on the tracks, I'm going to mix this in a three quarters to one quarter mix, heavier on the European earth side.
So here we are the next day after doing all the washes and the pigment work. And generally, I'm pretty happy with the way it came out. I think it looks like a pretty used in the field Soviet tank. What I was going for was with the dirtiness. Uh, you know, the crew tracking dirt up where they might climb up and where they might walk around a little bit around hatches and panels. Um, same thing on the rear deck where they might walk around to check out some things and, and where they might be stepping and, you know, the tools and, and things like that, logically where it might be. It's a little heavy in some areas, so I'm gonna use a couple, especially on these, these blades here and on the, the big blades on the front. I don't wanna, I don't wanna get rid of all of it. I'm gonna use an airbrush cleaning brush to sort of give a, a naturally scraped look to it, just to clean it up a little bit and, and show that maybe some rocks and things have been brushed past it a little bit. To I wanna show off some of the bare metal look that we had on the edge there. Now, I could do this with an actual brush, but I think that would, that would really just get too much of it scraped off. And so this gives that impression of things moving across it. And especially there at the edge. And I don't know if the camera is really gonna focus on how that looks, but it gives that scraped up, but still dirty look. And so I'm gonna do that on some of the areas of the tank that I don't, that got a little bit more dirty than I wanted them to be. There's not a lot on here. A, a lot of it is the dirt is settled right where I wanted it to be. Um, just a couple little areas that I'm gonna clean up. There's a little just too much in this one particular area right here on the gun barrel. I want it dirty, but not just caked in mud. Like somebody took a shovel full at the beach and put it there. So I'm gonna do a little bit of cleaning up on the, uh, on the surfaces here just a little bit as I go. And then we'll be applying some, some dead flat, some really good matte, the Windsor and Newton Galleria. Then I'm gonna wanna do just a little bit more weathering of some exhaust stuff, which you'll, you'll see me get to with some Tamiya weathering compacts. These Tamiya compacts are, are convenient to use. You can save some money though, and just use either chalk or even oil pastels, just ground up on some sandpaper. I'm just, like I said, using them because they're convenient. I don't remember if I've mentioned it before, but working on this with the turret permanently attached by those wires is a real pain in the ass sometimes. After all that work we have, and I want to be careful not to mess with any of the pigment work or anything, we have what I think is a very nicely worn main battle tank. Um, after putting on the flat, you can see we've got that bare metal, just that little bit of metal around the edges shows through again. So we just got kind of one more step to go here. What we've got now is we've got many periscopes and lenses and things. And by the way, here are the missile launchers for the sides and our gun. And then just some splashed fuel and oil around the drums and everything just to finish this thing off. A few minor things and then we are all set. And um, pre oh, and I have to make those straps for the stowage. But uh, you can see, I'll say this over and over again, Windsor & Newton is my favorite matte coat, my favorite flat. It just does the job better than anything else. So I love the way just that subtle dirt tracked around where the crew walks i love that i love the way that comes out just adds that little bit you know and we are finally finished this model took me an embarrassingly long amount of time to do there were just a lot of speed bumps along the road a lot that i couldn't control but it's done it's done and you can see we've got our lenses painted and i'll tell you exactly which colors of 
uh, color shift paints we used to do the periscopes in a minute, but they came out pretty good. The last detail to do was the, the fuel stains along the barrels because messy crews out in the field, especially conscript army, poorly trained crews, they're going to spill some stuff as they take care of the tank and poorly maintained seals and stuff like that. There's always going to be some fuel drips and everything. So that is either a Vallejo or an AK interactive um, fuel stains. I can't remember which one it is, but overall, I'm very happy with the work. I think it does really have that look of a 1980s, 1990s Soviet era into Russian era tank. The detailing kind of met my intention for what we were doing there. And like I said before, you know, once we got the flat on there, you could start to see the chipping effects and the bare metal effects coming out. So it just looks like a tank that has really served its life and whether it's in exercise or in combat has done its duty to the motherland and, uh, and detailing just really brings it to life this was put out it's an excellent model kit it really is i think they intend it almost as a I don't know, as a novelty kit or kind of a toy kit, you know, the the snap together, you don't have to paint. Obviously, more advanced modelers can put their, their touches on it and it can be painted or not. Um, oh yes, of course, these straps on the stowage. That's, that's just two millimeter masking tape that is painted. And we may, made some, some buckles and some flaps for it to make it look a little realistic. I know it's not the most realistic to have it tie down over the running board, but you know what, Fender, but it is what it is. So this was a great project. I loved doing it. It was really, I mean, just fun to do and to imagine it. The guns are movable. I just have them positioned. And the turret, of course, is fully traversable, but most important, you have your evil red eyes. And of course, I have lights for the filming here, but... You have your evil red Soviet eyes looking at you. Those periscopes and optics for the main periscopes, um, Turbo Dork Mother Load. Okay, if you if you do it over white, you get that kind of pearly pink color. If you do it over black, you get that green shifting color. So I did it over black. Now let me see if I can turn off these lights. There we go. Which gives it a very realistic kind of um, green iridescent periscope color. So I did that. The main red color on the scopes is the Nebula Copper by Green Stuff World, which I think fits. We also have elements in Royal Burgundy by Green Stuff and um, Curacao by Turbo Dork also, just some little elements. And that's the, you know, the optics on the gun, the commander's main optic, the gunner's optics. I kind of, I kept them, I kept them all similar because if you look, you kind of have, you have the same shape, basically the same set of three here for the gunner as you do above the driver. So I kept the size and the, and the elements kind of the same. The commander's main optic here matches the big one for the driver and the gunner, you know, and then we've got some optics here and I, I just kind of kept the color scheme similar. So it sort of made sense, you know, but this is a great kit. I love doing this kit. Um, I would definitely do another one in the main um, the main color scheme that it's intended for the game without all the modifications. I just had a really good time doing it. You can also, if you wanted to stow these down, you could. There's some options with this tank. Um, but So I appreciate all those who watched the whole saga of getting this tank done and all of my little shorts updates with it. Um, and I'm sorry I didn't get it done in a faster time frame. But here it is. I hope you enjoyed seeing it. I'm gonna move on to some other projects. I still have that M4 Sherman to do. I have a couple, I have, a, I have so many projects I wanna do, that's the problem. There's so many that I want to get done, I just, they build up on me. I guess that's every modeler though, huh? I'm gonna get back to work on the Sherman, but I have something else I have to, I have to get done right away because um, I'm super excited about it. But that's every modeler, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, I'll have some, um, some really good high quality, um, you know, color corrected pictures 
you know, taking these bright lights into account right after this. So anyway, thanks again, guys. I hope you enjoyed the process and you like what you see here. Remember, everybody else building out there in YouTube land, keep building them, build them well, and I'll see you again on the bench real soon.